I feel so much peace today. And I know that God could do anything tonight, literally anything. I really believe that some of you are going to be set free tonight by things you haven't even realized you've been in bondage to. I believe this. I'm praying, I'm going, God, it, it, it's, it's so real to me. Like, I'm, like I would say, Randy, if at any point you just feel like you have to say something, please come up, interrupt me. Of course I would do that, and that's very real. That's very like tangible. It could happen. But I'm, I'm giving God that permission. Not that he needs it, but I'm just saying, God, I would love it. Lord, if I'm going the wrong direction and you just give me something, I just need to know that it's you. But I thank God for this peace. You know, there's times, uh, sometimes I'll speak, this is more in the past, but I would speak to groups of kind of more scholarly, not to say you're not, but I'm just saying like, like, uh, you know, like that's what they're known for. Everyone comes, they want you to come and say something smart. And, and I just feel this pressure. I study, I, you know, ask my smart friends, give me something smart to say, you know, and, and I come up and there's just this pressure. And, uh, and then it's just me speaking these words in the flesh that I'm trying so hard to get across and nothing happens. And I even remember my wife one time afterwards going, what was that all about? And I remember this true story. Next time I'm going to speak to a group like that, you know, I'm like, hey, honey, I'm going. I'm flying to wherever. And she goes, honey, please don't try to sound smart. She goes, people don't ask you to speak because you're intelligent. That's not what they're asking you for. And I thought, oh, okay, okay, you're right, you're right. Um, but it's interesting. This is new to me. And there's another type of pressure that I could feel because I know that some of the speakers here and presenters are just godly, godly men and women, and they've done miraculous things. God has used them to do supernatural things, so it's very easy for me to come up and go, ooh, I better do something. <laughs> you know, like, I better, like, <laughs> But it's so great to feel like I don't feel any of that pressure. Um, the Lord might. He might do something that just blows my mind, and I hope that he does. And I believe that he could, but there's, there's just peace this morning. It's just such a great season in life for me right now. Uh, God has been just opening my eyes to so many things these last few months. And uh, in, in, in fact, I want you to join me in this. I started praying a prayer a few months ago, and it has been awesome. I've been asking God, please show me where I am deceived. Hey, because because we've all been deceived, right? We've all believed things in the past where we go, wow, how did I get there? What was I thinking? But but how do you know you're not there right now? You know, and, and it was just like this revelation, like I know when I'm tempted, but I don't know when I'm deceived. I mean, are you deceived right now? You don't know, right? That's, that's kind of the definition. Like, and that is the enemy. 
He gets us believing things that are not true, and we don't know it. You don't know what you don't know. So our only hope is to pray that very prayer and come before God and go, God, I know there have been so many times I've been off on things and, and I'll teach them and I'll live them out and I'll feel these things you don't want me to feel, but I don't know. Right now, God, please fix anything. Show me where I'm deceived. And I thought by praying that, that it would be a painful experience. You know, like he's going to show me the sin. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. And I'm like, bring it. Bring it. I just want to be right. But really, it's been the opposite. And everything he's revealed to me has been so good and gentle and life-giving. I feel like I'm happier than I ever have been. And, and I am very confident that this next season in my life is going to be even better. I, I really do, because he has revealed some things to me in the last few weeks even that have just blown my mind, opened up my heart, given me even more joy when I didn't think it was possible, but really has taken me to another level. And I'm just asking you, Lord, give me the grace to pass this on to my brothers and sisters right now, that this grace, this peace, this joy that he has shown me, I can somehow just give you a taste of this because it's huge. A lot of it comes from 2 Corinthians 5.14, where Paul says, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. Now, that word compel, it's this idea of, it's like a rushing water and, and, and the river banks kind of controlling it. It's, it's like pushing it. The, the word means to, to overpower or to control. I love what the New English Bible says. It says, uh, the love of Christ leaves me no choice. That everything was motivated by the love of Christ. And so I began to look at my life. I've been in ministry for about 40 years, almost 40 years now. And I began to evaluate my life. I go, how many things th that I've done, how many events I've spoken at or whatever, how much of that was motivated by a love of of Christ. So even, why am I here? It's very easy to say, well, you know, Randy invited me to come speak at this thing, and so I went. We, we can just get to doing things. Rather than, is it that I am so filled with the love of Christ that I can't wait to come here and share it with you. Is that really my motivation? And I started looking at all the things that I've been doing for the last 40 years. I'm going, God, how much of this was compelled by the love of Christ? And how much of it did I just feel was responsibility, the right thing to do? This is big. This is really big. For us to know the love of Christ so deeply and enjoy the love of Christ so much that that is what compels us to do what we do. This is so big that I believe because Christians are not compelled by the love of Christ. This is why the world does not find Christianity compelling.
We, we sometimes can sound like employees of a restaurant going, yes, come, try our food. Here's a coupon. Here, here's a free sample. Versus the person that just went and ate at a restaurant and comes running out like, oh my gosh, you've got to try this. You ever been there? You ever gone to a place, you tasted the food, and, and you, you don't work for the restaurant, but you're telling all your friends about it. Why? Because you want to see that look on their face when they taste it. And they go, yes, that was so good. See, is it the love of Christ where you've tasted and you go, gosh, I have this time with him and he really has filled me up so much that you just, you, it compels you. You start telling your friends, look, trust me, trust me, this is so good. Versus, oh, the Bible says to go make disciples of all nations. I better do it. You know? We've, done, we've all done it, right? You feel guilty. You know it's your responsibility. But it's not the love of Christ that compels you. And is this why America does not find Christianity compelling? Because they're looking at us. It's this big... God's shown me a lot of the reasons why I do what I do is not the love of Christ. And it's a scary thing because then I make disciples who can follow in that same pattern. One of the elders at my church the other day, he was telling me how he was about to teach Romans 8 and he was really struggling. And he says, this is why. He goes, I, I worked for a company. Um, he's a consultant, major consultant, uh, major company. And he was explaining his job to me. He goes, so if a company hires me, you know, they say, hey, we want this guy for a week. He goes, then my company will bill their company $70,000 for that week. It's a lot of money. He goes, and then my job is to make sure that that company I'm consulting makes 10 times the amount they paid me. So I've got to produce $700,000 worth of result in my week being there. And he was explaining his job, and he goes, one of the things we teach, he goes, and this is, you know, he's PhD, he's just brainiac type of guy, but he goes, what we learn and what we teach is the best employees are insecure overachievers. He goes, if you want to hire the best workers, find insecure people who are overachievers. If you find them, they'll be your best workers. And then he goes, what we teach is every week, every week, evaluate them. And every week, make sure you find at least one thing they are doing wrong. Because in their insecurity, they will try to please you. And because they're overachievers, they're going to work so much harder at fixing that one thing. This is how you produce. And he goes, it works. You get the results. You get the productivity. You get this work that you didn't get before. He goes, you're destroying their soul, but it works. And he goes, I, he goes, I realized my job was about teaching people how to prod other people's insecurities. And he goes, that's what I was realizing. He goes, that's why I didn't want to teach Romans 8, 1, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There was this sick side of me that thought, let me keep them a little bit insecure because that will lead them to right behavior. And just kind of prod the insecurity. Are you sure he's the Lord of that area of your life? And like, oh, maybe not. Maybe I'm not saved. Okay, I'm, I'm 
I am really not going to, I'm not going to watch TV. I'm not going it, to, it, it creates a right behavior. And he told his church, I didn't want to tell you today that there's no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Because my mind just thought, well, then you'll just run off and do whatever you need to do. Whatever you feel like doing, you'll just go run rampant in your sin. He says, God is not like my company. And he said, I, I don't want the right behavior for the wrong reasons. And when he said that, I, I almost burst into tears. I just started thinking, wow, there's insecurity in me. And it's motivated some of the things that I do. And I try, I haven't thought about God just loving me. See, for most people, and he was explaining this, he goes, most of us when we're kids, you know, if we have a weird relationship with our, our parents, we, we think we're doing stuff to try to earn their love, but you can't earn their love. You can earn their approval. They can approve of things that you do, and, and for most of us, that's good enough. We like when people approve of us. It feels good when they approve of what we do. But that's very different from love. That's very different from saying, wow, when I was a sinner and I was an enemy of God and I'm just sitting here doing nothing, God has this flood of emotion and love and desire towards me. Doesn't mean he approves of my lifestyle, but he loves me. And many of us, maybe we grew up not being loved. And we're just seeking approval. And just wanting them to approve of something we did. And we strive and strive, and then we start thinking of God the same way. Okay, God, do you love me this week? You must love me more this week because I was disciplined. I got up. I got my time with you. I was in the Word every day. I, I, I got my thoughts clean. I, and we're seeking, seeking, seeking rather than really believing in the love of God and the love of Christ. In the church, sometimes we can be about production. And we're not thinking about why we do what we do. There's selfish ambition. The Bible says where there's envy or jealousy or selfish ambition, where they exist, so will every vile practice. And I can't tell you there, there wasn't a time in my life when I wanted to be that guy up front or I wanted to have the top podcast or I want to have the best-selling book. I want to be known. Selfish ambition. I'm producing results, though. People are showing up. But it wasn't the love of Christ that compelled me. It was my own selfish ambition can start to love applause. Other times, there have been times when I feel so guilty for my past, and there's a sense in which I want to make up for something. And there have been times in my life when I honestly wasn't sure of my own salvation. And so I start working harder to make sure he's really Lord of my life and to prove it to myself and to prove it to him. 
you know, all these insecure feelings drew, caused me to do the right things, but it was not the love of Christ that compelled me. So I want to talk about that today. How, I, I mean, for some of you, maybe you can relate to me where you're going, yeah, I, I do some of these things just because they're right or because I feel guilty or I feel pressured or, I've, you, you know, or, or it's selfish ambition. Or, how do we get to the point where it's really the love of Christ that compels us? There's four passages, four verses that I think will help us, that have helped me anyways. One of them is 1 Peter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. So so in this passage, he's saying like newborn babes long for the pure spiritual milk. I was looking at this and, and and I see that, you know, in chapter one, he's talking about the word of God. But then in chapter two, It could be that he's just continuing that thought he is about the word of God. But then he says to long for the pure spiritual milk if you've tasted that the Lord is good. And then he says you come to him a living stone. So I always just thought, well, it's just talking about this book. But it's talking about more than that. And when you read chapter one, you see there's not really this this strong division or bifurcation of here's God and here's his word, but they're kind of intermingled. I mean, you can't separate God from what he says. But in this passage, it's a picture of a newborn baby just longing for milk. Okay, I have seven children. And I remember, my my oldest is 28 now, but I still remember the moment she was born. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. You know, when she's in my wife's womb and it's like moving everywhere, it's just, it's amazing, but it's weird. But the weirdest part, borderline creepy, is right when she was born, Right when she was born, I don't even remember if the nurse wiped her off or whatever. Like, she immediately, like I cut the cord, boom, she immediately goes to my wife and starts feeding and latches on. And I thought, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because I'm going, how did she know? How do you know that? You, all you've been, you've been like underwater for months. And you've got this tube that feeds everything. The moment you come out, you go, I'm just, I'm going there. It was the most, it was so strange. I was just like, whoa. You don't have to teach her. You don't have, and it's, it's that idea here. He's just like newborn infants long for the spiritual milk. It's an idea, and I was, I was just thinking how, the most natural thing for those of us who've been born again is to immediately go into the presence of God and latch on and connect with him. But so often that's not what we teach. It's like we don't trust that. We're like, okay, now that you believe, come to this class. Here's your discipler. Go through this and then this and then this and then this. Join this, do this. And, and all those things are good. 
But there's almost like this side of us that doesn't trust the natural process that when the Spirit of God enters into a person, they're going to want to just get in a room, be alone with their Creator, and go, oh, I can be here with you, you and me. And because we don't emphasize that, I'm meeting people all the time that have known God, they say, have been Christians for 10, 20 years. And I go, man, just go in the woods and spend a day with him. And they're like, a day? What would I do? What would I say? I can barely pray for three minutes. Because we're not training people to long for the pure milk we immediately start getting the formulas and start bottle feeding them where they're going, okay, I need a podcast. I need a, I, I need a Bible study. I need, I need someone's, you know, you know, chart, a discipleship book. What do I do? What do I do? Because we've raised them. We've bottle fed them rather than teaching them to go directly into the presence of God and receive from him and enjoy him and taste and see that the Lord is good. Second verse is uh, Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, verse 11 It says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I love this verse. You make known to me the paths of life, the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you really believe this? That at the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. Like there, and, and I'm realizing a lot of us believe that God can bring pleasure, but we kind of feel like it caps out at a certain point. I mean, it's not like going surfing or golfing or whatever your, your thing is. You know, I want God too. But there's almost like we feel like there's a limit to how much pleasure that time with the Lord could really give us. Even though the scripture says, wait a second. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. The God who created sex says at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. You guys look shocked that I said he created sex. <laughs> he did. He did. It's not like he looked at Adam and Eve and go, hey, what are you doing? Get off her. It, 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 it was this thought where God created us as beings who enjoy pleasure. But we would say, well, God doesn't offer pleasure like that as though this pleasure is greater than something he could offer. I mean, honestly, when I, I'm, I, I grew up very conservative, and so I struggled even reading like Song of Solomon. I did, I, I still do a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay, let's, let's move on. Uh, I'm not gonna read to my kids, you know, let's read another, just skip that book, you know. Because there's a side where we go, gosh, they're getting pretty sexual in this book. What's the point of that? God is saying, 
my love is better than life. You got to understand the amount of pleasure I can offer. Who do you think created this? Why do you think I allowed that book to be canonized? It's because at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. But I think most of us just believe that God can give us some pleasure, some happiness, and then we start looking elsewhere for that major thrill. And it's because of that boredom and that disbelief in the God who created sex that we run to other things. And then the love of Christ doesn't compel us. It's not enough for us. Third verse is Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Which I love the book of Ephesians. Uh, I've never really preached through the entire book, and I'm just told my elders, I go, I gotta preach Ephesians soon. I'm just ready to burst. Um, it's so good. But in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18. He's praying, and he's praying for the church, and he's praying that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. He, he's praying, saying, okay, okay think about this. Because he, he goes, I'm on my knees. He goes, this is the reason I get on my knees. And I'm just asking God that he would give you the strength. The strength to comprehend together with all the saints. He goes, just how wide and long and high. and deep. You got to know how much he loves you. But he's saying, this isn't something that I can just teach you because it's beyond comprehension. That's why I'm on my knees going, God, please, would you just show it to them? May they get it. Because ever since I became a Christian in high school, I've always known that Jesus loves me. That's one of the first things you're taught it's that first verse we learned. But understanding that and comprehending how much he loves us, how wide and long and high and deep, that's a completely different issue. And I never got that. I'm still trying to understand this. I've had a crazy breakthrough this month, and I'm embarrassed to say that at age 55. But I've just dealt with insecurity, I guess. Like, I honestly saw God as loving me because He has to, because that's His character. And I know that's not biblical. I'm just saying that's in there. And to sit and really believe, and I'm, it's starting to happen, where I'm going, wait, so you don't just love me, but I'm starting to see, like, this is love like, like nothing, like how wide and long and high and deep. See, we have this hang-up, or at least I do, and you might, where if you ask me how powerful is God, I'd go, I can't even describe. Like, like think of the strongest person you know. 
in your mind right now, think about the biggest, strongest person you know. And now compare their power to God's. It's laughable, right? It's silly. It's like, wow. It's, it's nothing. Now, 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 now try to think of the most intelligent person you know. Now compare their intelligence to God's. Right? It's, it's comical. It's like, well, I wouldn't even do that. But now think about the loving, the most loving person you know, the person who's loved you the best. Like, do you believe that God's love is just, it's just incomparable. Like for some of us, we have a hang up with that one. We know the power, we know the knowledge, the omniscience. But to sit here and go, man, he loves me a million times more than anyone has ever loved me in my life. And to believe that at the core of your soul, in your inner man. Paul says that takes a miracle and that's why I'm on my knees saying, God, give them the strength in their inner man to grasp, to comprehend that this is not just a little love because they can understand your holiness. They can understand your power. They can understand your intellect. But for you to know the love of Christ that surpasses comprehension, I think there are many of us in this room who have not comprehended how wide How long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ towards you? And I'm just thanking God that he's opening my eyes to this. But but interesting thing about that verse, I I was reading a book this week and, and it was actually talking about that verse and I never noticed this, but The idea is that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. So I always thought, okay, well, I need to comprehend it just like Paul comprehended, like John comprehended, like Mary comprehended, like, you know, whoever your favorite Christian is. You know, like, I need to comprehend like they comprehended. But the interesting thing in this book, it was saying, No, there's something about being with other saints. That there's something about when we gather together, and this is what I got excited. Why I got excited about tonight is I thought maybe, please take this the right way. but maybe I had to be in the room in order for some of you to comprehend it. There's something about us being together. And maybe I needed tonight when you prayed for me before I came up here out at the front area and I needed you Joanne to pray for me right there that somehow with all the saints we're then able to comprehend how wide and long and high and deep like maybe some of you needed to hear from a guy who when I was born, my mother died. So my dad gave me up for adoption. He didn't want me, I killed his wife just by being born. Gave me up for adoption, my grandma's like, no, you don't, my aunt, or they're like, no, you don't just give away. He already had it all set up. And they took me away. Grandma took me to Hong Kong till, till she was too old to take care of me, and then, then, then it's like, you have to take this boy back. He's five now. By then, my dad's remarried, and he's got, you know, he had my older brother and sister, and now he's got a younger half-sister, and he's like, 
whatever. He don't want me. And then I got an older brother and sister. They're like, who's this kid? He doesn't even speak English. And you, 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 they didn't want me. So I grow up. I'm growing up in this. No one wants. Everyone would rather I didn't exist. And so as I would strive and strive and just trying to get my dad to, to, to approve of me, I thought to love me or, or just, just smile at me, just talk to me once, just stop hitting me so hard. Never got it. When I, when I was 12, that's when he died. My stepmom had already died by then too. And when he died, I was like, oh, good. There's no one here to beat the heck out of me anymore. Coming to a new country, trying to learn English, trying to just get anyone to approve of me. Let me on your team. Play with me. What? So, so to, to grow up, always just wanting someone's approval, and then to believe to where God's got me now, where I'm going, wait a second, you loved me that whole time. So, so all of that striving, 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 trying to get this, trying to get that, and even in the Christian world, oh, you're going to deviate from our theological pocket a little bit? You're done. It's real. Maybe some of you are going to be like, the whole night didn't do a single miracle. You know what, whatever. Right? It's just like this crazy, insecure, well, 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 will you like me? Well, what if I, what if I? And now, I can honestly tell you, I believe in the love of Christ, I'm getting how wide and long and high and deep. I'm enjoying it. I'm receiving it to where I can walk up here and go, I don't feel any pressure. I'm so loved right now. Do you know how much he loves me? Do you understand how wide and long and high and deep? Then maybe it takes that for some of you to admit, oh man, he admitted it and he's a speaker. He's a, you know, he wrote crazy love, hypocrite. You, you know, for you, maybe that's what it takes. That now together with one added saint, you're starting to go, okay, I get this. So God could reveal to me tonight, together with all the saints, just how wide and long and high and deep. Because some of us are terrible at receiving love because we're not used to it. You know, it's like if you've never played guitar and I bring you up here and go play us something. You're like, I, I've never seen one of those. I've never learned how to play one of those. We're talking about receiving the love of Christ. And some of you, maybe we're like me where you're going, I don't know that I ever received love. I just kept trying to earn approval. So then when I get in a relationship with God, I just do the same thing. And I feel like he disapproves of me one week, he approves of me next week, or he loves me one week, he doesn't love me so much the next week, then I wait till do a few more good things before I pray to again. And it's just this roller coaster. And then you start doing things out of your insecurity, or out of fear, or out of pride, and you're not compelled by the love of Christ. And it's such a better way to live. It's such a great way to live. Last verse. Romans 5, 5. Romans 5, 5. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts. God's love has been poured into our hearts. See, Paul in Ephesians says it's a love that's beyond comprehension. You can't just know it. I can put the, you know, I can diagram it on a screen, explain it to you mathematically. Well, this verse says this, so therefore he loves you. And he goes, you don't get it that way. But what Romans 5.5 5 says is it's more mystical than that. He says that the Holy Spirit actually pours the love of Christ directly into my heart. See, this is different from what I was taught. People say, well, you get it in your mind, and then you've got to make that 18-inch transition from your mind to your heart. And so I'm like, okay, I get it in my head, get it in my head, uh, 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 go down, you know. And you go, but how do you do that? How do you transition it? And what this verse says is, no, there's something more beautiful that can actually happen. The Holy Spirit can actually pour it right into your heart. And we've been having the greatest worship times in our church gatherings because we're just saying, God, okay. Some of us have been studying this book for years. And like we're getting it, but we're not really getting it. And we see why Paul is saying, I'm on my knees asking God, give him the strength. It's got to be inside their inner man. Open the eyes of their heart and lighten the eyes of their heart. And, and to believe that God could actually tonight pour it directly into your heart. And that bothers some of us because we go, intellectually, I don't understand how that happens. I understand when I hear something and my brain cognitively goes, hmm, I understand that. I get that. I've studied the brain. But what is this thing about The Holy Spirit, can he really bypass my brain and go straight to my heart? And I go, I just thought of this this week. I go, it has to be. Otherwise, a kid with special needs could never know the love of Christ. It means these people that God created. How would they know the love of Christ? They don't have our intellect. I have a friend who's a special needs teacher. And he says, I was praying to the Lord one day going, God... How do I minister to these people who don't comprehend? I can't, I can't explain your love to them. And he says, and God just opened my eyes in a moment. He says, what do you think's going on in heaven right now? Do you think everyone's speaking in English at your intellect level? Don't you realize he had to dumb it down so that we could comprehend it? And so do we really think the gap between us and that kid with special needs is that big? That God, you could reach down and get it into my mind but not into his? 
And, and then I'm looking at this verse, and I'm going, that's it. There's some mystery. And the love of Christ is not for those who have the highest IQ. You're going to figure it out the best. It's like, God, because that's just what he is. He's a God of love. He is love. It's just he has this great love with which he loved us, the Bible says. And it's, it's not like he had it at one moment in time. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's steadfast. As much as he loved us at that moment on the cross, it's not like it dissipated. It's less, it just keeps coming. And by his spirit, it's his desire to just pour it into our hearts to where those of you who have never really known the love of Christ, and you're here for some other reason, some other motivation, and maybe you've even been in ministry, but you're compelled by so many things, all that could change tonight. Says so God says, I want you to taste and see that I'm good. I want you to taste of something tonight to where you go out and you can't contain yourself because it tastes so good. And you can't even completely explain it. My experience will be different from your experience. But this is what I've been praying for tonight. That we just trust God's word. Do you believe that like a newborn babe, those of you who believe in him, you can immediately latch on to him tonight. You become one with him. And that is the most natural thing. You don't need me. I could help. Like I said, the, the saints, there's something about us being together, but it's also the most natural thing for you as a newborn babe to go for the pure milk. It's you and God. Do you believe 1 Peter 2.2? 2, 2? Do you believe Psalm 16 verse 11 that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore? That we're not asking you to do something that's boring, that has a limit to it and isn't like all these other pleasures he created, by the way. But do you believe he can be that fulfilling And do you believe how wide and long and high and deep that God loves you a million times more than you've ever loved anyone? Just like his strength is superior and his knowledge is superior, greater love has no one than this. And do you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? I figure I didn't have to ask that one here. Um, but sometimes, you know, we believe that he can heal the blind. But we don't believe that he can break through all of this insecurity. I mean, this is a group of people that supposedly believe in spiritual warfare. But what is Second Corinthians all about, the spiritual warfare, is we wage war against these thoughts. And we take every thought captive. And so these thoughts of, he doesn't love me that much, we can destroy that tonight. Okay? That's what we're going to have faith in right now. That doesn't mean that some of you won't get healed physically. It doesn't mean that you might not get a word from the Lord, or I still might. But there's some way in which we have power that's not of this world. 
And that power is to destroy every lofty thought and all these arguments and all these voices in your head that tell you you're not good enough and you haven't earned their love. Even though love isn't something you can earn. But all those thoughts, we can kill them tonight. And I believe that I've been healed. I've tasted. And I'm just coming here tonight going, you gotta taste this. You gotta try this. He can do this. Break through all the insecurity, all the rejection. And he wants to. Because he desires you so much. Even when you were at your worst, he had so much desire for you. He's a God of love. So I'm just going to pray right now. And for those who have struggled receiving this huge love that he offers, would you just open up your hands right now and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit bypasses your brain and just pours his love directly into your heart. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I draw near with confidence to your throne of grace. You're a God of grace. And I ask you, Lord, now to pour your grace upon us. Holy Spirit, pour the love of Christ into our hearts. God, I don't want to know this by myself. I want to know it together with all the saints in this room. How wide and long and high and deep. We want to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge.
Just receive his love right now. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Thank you, God. May we all rest in your love tonight. Enjoy your love tonight. Taste and see that you are good. In the name of Jesus, we break off the lies that have been in our minds, treating you like, like you're a man, like you're just another human. You're like no one else. Your love is out of this world. We trust your word, Lord. Pray for all my brothers and sisters now, Lord, that they would just continue to crave the pure milk that comes directly from you. I don't want to spend another day in insecurity or do another thing out of duty. May we drink deeply of his love. In Jesus' name we pray.